Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift for the Giro d'Italia 2022 preview, a special edition. Benji Narsen and myself in the same room at the same time arrived yesterday in Budapest on location thanks to Zwift support for this Giro preview. How are you feeling, Benji? First impressions of Budapest and meeting me in person. Pretty good, actually. I uh, I was like, okay, what is this stranger doing at the airport? Who is this random man? Send help, <laughs> please. But he's actually a relatively nice guy in real life as well. So uh, I guess that's a positive. So uh, I can't complain so far. I mean, we put it up on Twitter yesterday. I just want to clarify for the record. I'm a, okay, I'm short. Like, I'll be honest about that. But I'm like normal short. People call me 165 centimeters. Benji's tall. People don't realize Benji's like six foot four. It's not my fault. Um I copped a bit of heat for that on Twitter, but it is what it is. Um, I am actually going to have to run this whole preview just off the top of my head because with these sunglasses, if you're watching on YouTube, I actually can't see anything right now inside. Um, There's the opacity so much on them. So that's just the commentator's curse, I guess, or the burden I have to bear for this preview. But as I said, it starts in Budapest, the Giro, this year. It's... Uh, then going down to Sicily with a transition stage on stage between stages three and four for the first three stages here in Hungary, and then works its way up from south to north of Italy. It's not as hard as previous years, in my view. There's some stages, although the harder stages stage last year was kind of scrubbed a little bit. So it's it's not the hardest course, Benji. Like, how do you how do you see it in terms of like? There's no one Giro stage where I'm like, wow, that's why the Giro is so much harder than the Tour. Yeah, I agree in that, and I feel like it's a bit backloaded the parkour where it's more in the initial phases. We've got stages that go to a punch or a rider that could go in the breakaway or a sprinter and so forth, and then towards the end or at least the middle, it starts heating up a bit. There's a few stages that can have GC gaps and. Towards the end is really where the real gaps are going to come, and that's where GC will likely be uh, completely decided. But uh, it's a parkour that offers uh, fighting chances for GC, but the riders will have to make the race. That's how I see it. Thankfully, thankfully, we have Carapaz with a strong team here. We'll get into all the GC contenders, then the sprinters, because it's a strong sprint field, actually. And then we'll go stage by stage, as we always do, before giving our predictions at the end of the race but before we get into that as i said it's thanks to zwift that benji and i are here on the ground and to giro d'italia grande partenza zwift is the cycling app that makes training fun whether you're just trying to get a bit stronger on the bike for your weekend rides or preparing for a grand tour like cavendish at this year at italia there's something on zwift to help you get fitter and have more fun on the bike zwift has real world and fantasy locations to ride in hundreds of workouts on demand training plans, a packed calendar of group rides, pace partners to drop in with at a set pace, and even the ability to create your own meetup. Spending more time on the bike, thanks to Zwift, has certainly helped my and Benji's fitness over the past few months. So if you haven't given it a go, head to Zwift.com for a free seven-day trial. But GC contenders here, Benji, Carapaz, he's like the $2.50 favorite, shorter than Bernal was last year. Bernal was co-favorite with Simon Yates when they went into it. Why is Carapaz so short? Oh, I think it's the fact that he's got a podium at the Tour de France last year. He uh, has his Giro victory in the past already. Next to that, also, if he would have had a decent support in that Vuelta against Roglic in 2020, he'd likely actually have won that Grand Tour as well. So he's the rider on the start list that has the most proven GC capabilities because if you look at the other riders that are favorites, like Simon Yaten and Almeida, and Almeida is unproven when it comes to the podium so far. And Simon Yates is inconsistent. So those are like the aspects that also improve Carapaz's chances versus them. And when we look at the team surrounding them, a Port, a Castro Viejo, a Ben Tullet, Nervais, Pucho, Sivakov, and Ben Swift, that's a pretty damn strong team, I'd argue, to support him. It's not necessarily their Tour de France level team, but it's definitely good enough compared to some of the other teams that are surrounding the GC favorites of other teams. And my question for you when it comes to that team is, do you consider Carapaz like 100% complete leader or do you think that Richie Port might actually fall into a co-leader role? Well, I think Carapaz should be 100% leader like Port's. I mean, he hasn't strung together three good weeks since Tour de France 2020, which was a good level, but he 
yeah, it's weird. He said at the start of the year, I, I just want to, in my last year, I think, not be the leader. And then there's some words like, oh, maybe I'll get my own chance at the Giro. We saw Carapaz and Port last year at the Tour de France. Not the best combination when Port gave uh, Pogacar a lead out on stage eight. He then dropped Sivakov on stage three. The last stage of Tour of the Alps, I think, uh, when Sivakov was going for GC. So that makes me a bit nervous. But I think if you're Carapaz, you can't complain. Like we've been saying for years, give Carapaz some support. And he's got Castro um, in his first Grand Tour of the season. He's got Swift, Sivakov, Tull. Like it's a good team. But no Dunbar, Benji. Like what? What more does he have to do? He won Sedi Manakopi Bartoli. Is he injured? What? Is, like what is it? Because I think this is an indication that he's leaving. Because there's no way Tullet can be more helpful than Dunbar. No way. I agree in that aspect. Tullet was very similar, though, in Copia Bartoli, for example. But I agree that Dunbar is a rider that I see more as a uh, a domestic role in the mountains, better than, for example, a Ben Tullet here. And next to that, I'm also. Ben Swift is also the kind of rider that I'm like, okay, meh. But then I look at his results in previous years and he's always very consistent throughout Grand Tours. And I think despite me not necessarily seeing him on the level in the mountains as a uh, Dunbar, I do think that Ben Swift can offer a consistent support work in most of the terrains, to be honest, for Carapal. So I think this team, they're regardless of Dunbar not being there, is still very, very strong. And I'm curious if even Narvaez could have a try at the first stage we'll talk about later on. Second favorite, Simon Yates, off the back of Parry Nice, nearly beating Roglic on GC, incredible last stage uh, there on Coldez. And then he didn't do Tour of the Alps. He's done Vuelta Asturias. He won the first stage easily, lost all the time on the second stage, won the third stage easily. Whether that's a training thing, people saying, like he's, didn't want to do three hard days in a row. I'm not sure whether it was just being Simon Yates. They didn't expressly say that. But he's here with a complete GC team. There's no Groenewegen. There's no uh, Caden Grove sprint option. It's Cranach, Hamilton, Hepburn, House, and Julians and Scotts and Sobrero. So it's it's not, of course, the Castro Viejos of the world or Richie Port, but they're all committed. They're all experienced. Sobrero's improving. Housen's a good, like, you know, 10K, 6% sort of climb climber. Um, and so, yeah, he's. I think he should be probably second favorite, although I just always think he's going to have a, a terrible day. Almeida's also on the same odds at 650. Um, and I think this is where I think there's more, something could go wrong here, Benji. You've got the Portuguese contingent, Almeida, Oliveira, Costa. Okay, that's fine. But those guys are not, the best riders supporting him or needing to support him, Covey Formolo, uh, Ulisi, the Italian block, and then Richese is being the lead-out man for Figueiredo, so they're separate. Do you think the Italians will ride 100% for Almeida? Like, Davide Formolo, like, I'm, I'm not convinced he will. Ooh, that's spicy. I think I saw an interview or something about him in the early parts of the season where he mentioned that for the Giro, he'd like to have his own chance or a free role necessarily because he was talking about the GC chance in the future and so forth. And he was saying that he might try and go for top 10 in GC himself. But let's be honest, if Almeida's in your team, if I'm Almeida and I hear that Formulo wants to get a top 10 in GC, I'm, I'm, I'm breaking tables in half. Like, uh, I wouldn't be happy with that at all. And I do hope that he falls into a domestic role completely for, uh, for Almeida because... Yeah, well, what's the point then? If you've got a clear podium competitor, in my opinion, when it comes to Almeida, and you don't even want to have Formula work for him as a team, then there's something wrong. So I think that's a thing. My question surrounding the team is, Gaviria Richese. Gaviria hasn't been performing very well recently. Mate, he's washed. But I want to add, like, is Richese coming with Gaviria? a sunk cost fallacy at this point where they invested in having him as a contract until the Giro once again to have him as a lead out for Gaviria here. Would they still have put a lead out in this race if they knew that Gaviria the last two weeks hasn't been great? So what you're saying is you want them to bring Ayuso and replace yes. like Almeida. <laughs> I would love to hear that. I mean, I, I see what you mean, but it's like Ackerman they've sent to races with no lead out. So I'm not sure they do think that way about like it's not their money, Giannetti and Matchin. It's 
the money comes from above. So I think they just want to put the best team out there. I think it's more just like Richese, they they asked Richese to come back, I think. To do, and he was like, okay, if I can do the Giro and then I'll retire after the Giro. So I more think it's a relationships thing than uh, thinking about money and, and that sort of thing. Um, I do think Almeida's got to be consistent because he doesn't want to give, remember with Remco last year, he, he doesn't want to give these guys an excuse. Formula on a lot of money, Formula top 10 yeah. GC before Formula Italian. Don't be like lagging on a random medium mountain stage, losing two minutes and then give the director – that that opportunity with Formula in his ear to be like, I'm not going back for him. I'm I'm running for my own GC now. That's that's the risk I see for Almeida. I'm not, and if you're Formula, that's sort of semi rational. Like that's not even necessarily being a bad team player uh, as well. But yeah, that's they're the three big GC favourites. We'll go into the big sprinters in a second but i want to mention a new supporting sponsor for the lrcp giro coverage we are supported by gcn plus you can watch all 3410 kilometers live and ad free on gcn plus who have live rights worldwide excluding new zealand catch up when it suits you with full stage replays on demand highlights all available on any screen so you can watch anytime anywhere i'm pretty confident that i was one of the first people in the world to sign up to GCM Plus when it became available as without it I couldn't have done my job in Australia watching all the races throughout the year and as a bonus all LRCP listeners from the US, UK, Australia, Canada and Germany can get 25% off an annual GCN Plus subscription by heading to gcn.eu slash LRCP which is in the description down below. Sprinters Field Benji, this is pretty stacked. Compared to the, the tour last year, after Ewan crashed out, who have we got here for the, from the sprinters? Well, basically, Mark Cavendish is here, for example. Caleb Ewan, Arnaud Demar, Giacomo Nizzolo, William Girmay, I think we can count him as a sprinter these days, Mathieu van der Poel and Magnus Court Nielsen. Are those all the names on the list, or do you see someone else popping up when you take a look at it? Uh, they're the big ones. I think what's really notable here is that Merku has been sent for the first 13 stages with Cavendish. That's unusual, and I think that is Benji part of the... That was how to keep Cav happy, that he wasn't going to the Tour. He's like, okay, Jakobsen's going to the Tour, fine, but you've got to give me Merku for the first two weeks of the Giro, and that, I guess, Lefebvre is... I mean, yeah, they've done that, and I think that makes a really, really big difference here. Ballerini was second last man in the Tour, uh, Asgrim was third last man. I think they've got – this isn't the Tour. This is the Giro. They can make do with Van Leeuwenhoek as third last man. Ballerini should be good enough to still be good second last man. I think he's got the best train. I don't think that's a very controversial statement. All on, on Lotto, I can see they've got um, – is Du Bois injured, Benji? Why, are, why am I not seeing Du Bois on the start list for – so Ewan, that's my concern with Ewan, regardless, is his lead-out train. He's the quickest man here. DeMar has got his traditional lead-out train with, you know, Guarnieri, Conovalovos, Ludwigs, and Sinkledam, Scottson, the big old train. Chimelai occasionally gets some good results. There's Bauhaus here, Benji. I think, wouldn't it be so Phil Bauhaus to just snag a, a stage somewhere later in the week when everyone's left? Probably, and he's like the only rider in this team, together with perhaps Suterlin, that might fit a cooperation for a sprint stage. Zutlin might be the guy that pilots him to the front before the sprint start, I would dare to say. So um, I, fee, I, I do see Bauhaus snacking a, uh, a stage somewhere. I don't know uh, which one yet, but uh, I see that as very much possible. But again, the sprinting field is big, so it depends on how long each sprinter stays in the race. Perhaps it could be a later stage. I don't know yet. For Chiclamino, Van der Poel should be the favorite. He said multiple times that he wants to finish this Giro d'Italia. We did a clip on that, uh, so somewhat to our surprise. So he's kind of backed himself into a corner there where, all right, you said you're going to finish this race. You made a big deal about it. You, you can't pull out after two weeks now, there's, but there's not many sprint stages after stage 13. Uh, so he's probably the favorite for Chick Lamino, but it's so like you and I would expect to disappear at some point. Um, I wouldn't expect him to complete it, nor even Bauhaus or probably DeMar, because as I said, there's really like stage 18 is the only other one. Nitsolo's here as well. He's looked in not great form at all. He didn't do well at Eschborn, which was just before this. And Germay, 
Jeremiah has not proven himself as a bunch sprinter yet. Uh, he did win in Mallorca, I understand that, in January, but as a bunch sprinter, there's not always got his positioning right. Um, but there are some hilly stages which suit him to come. But yeah, the, the that's the main sprint field. Any any other thoughts before we mention the GC outsiders, Benji, or which outsiders you think are being given way less chance than they should be? As a reminder that for the odds, Carapaz 250, Yates 650, Almeida 650, Lander 9, Lopez 11, Bardet 15, Dumo 17, Buchmann 23, Kelderman 23, Bilbao 29, Port 41. So no one really get, being given much of a chance after Bardet. Yes, true. I think that Lander surprisingly like highly rated, in my opinion, based on his last few weeks and so forth, and the fact that Bilbao is wearing number one on his back, and I'm not even sure that Lander is even full leader in that team. We have to see that based on the first few stages, I think. I think that's a team that will go to this race and will try and figure out in the first couple of stages, okay, who of the two will actually end up being the leadership role of this team, and They've got the support to do that with the pools, Butrago, Trotnik. That's a solid team surrounding those riders. Novak even was pretty strong in some races this year so far. So that's a team that I'm looking at. I'm like, okay, that's a strong team surrounding their riders. And I look similarly to at least the duo at Bardet's team, DSM. Adensman is also there. I uh, I low-key see Adensman doing pretty good at this Giro. What do you think of him? Uh, I don't see it with the long climbing yet. I also think he'll 100% be domestique for Bardet. So I I really, I, I don't see much of an opportunity for him. Kind of like with Sivakov, I just, maybe like he could get an eighth or seventh. He came eighth, I think, in the Giro ages ago in GC. But then domestique worked for Carapaz. Okay, in, in Tour of the Alps across five stages, you can sort of still get your own result. But Across three weeks of domestique duties, it will eventually pay the toll unless you're Danny Martinez and you're, we saw how good Danny Martinez is this year as a leader. So it's no surprise he came fifth when he was a domestique for Bernal uh, last year. For Lander, I'm telling you, Benji, Bahrain, he's the leader. I don't, it, whether it makes sense or not, he's the leader of that team. Even if Walt Poles won Andalusia, even if Bill Bowles looked really good, we saw in Carpeña when they should have let Bill Bowles go on the descent, they had, uh, yeah, Lander told Caruso to drop Bill Bowles. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really sure Bill Bowles um going to be a domestique, whether that's right or not. The crazy odds that I think is insane, Valverde, 81 to 1. He's done the Giro once. He podiumed the Giro. We have not many TTKs here. We do have some climbs to altitude, but we don't have we don't have the hard Motorola this year. We do have Motorola, but not hard side. We don't have... Stelvio to 2,700. I think that's crazy long for how good Balor looked. He came second at Flesh. I know Flesh is very different to a three-way Grand Tour, but is it – why is he so long? Is it because he hasn't done like his good long climbing performance like Portenay or Volta like he did last year? I think yes, and I think it's also the fact that Movistar kind of um... – they brought the idea forward at the start of the year that Sosa would be the GC leader. I've always had my doubts about that, personally, even though he did pretty good at Asturias last week. But when it comes to Valverde, I'm like, hmm. Uh, they were they were kind of like stage-oriented, trying to win stage and so forth. So whether they actually decide to do that or go for GC, I lean more likely that he's actually going to fall into a, a GC role throughout the race because, like... I find it so weird that Valverde gets this parkour and does not go for GC. That just doesn't doesn't say anything like to me. Yeah, although, you know, they signed Sosa. Probably when they signed him, they said, okay, Enric will go to the Tour and be leader and the Vuelta. So, you know, you, he was never going to get a Grand Tour leadership at Ineos. So maybe that was the agreement that he'd go. Whether Valverde sacrifices his race for him, I'm, I would be surprised. They have a pretty good team for Movistar at the Giro. So Samitier, Rojas, obviously always goes with Valo where he goes. Pedrero is good. Lascana was good in uh, Liège, I think. Barta, Arcas, not a bad team. Uh, so, yeah, I think just watch out for Bala. There's a lot of sort of misc. Uh, too hard for sprinters, too hard even for climbing sprinty boys, but like punchy finishes in this Giro that I think suit Valverde a lot. Breakaway stages. Yeah, probably. The wild <laughs> mother star control all day. Yeah, you, you're right. Um, but is there any other – try and look through the – what do you expect from Dumo and uh, Foss, Benji? I, I think like fifth to tenth is for one of them. 
is best case. I think Foz is the one that I'm looking at in that squad. I think they added some moment to the squad as third leader because they probably don't trust Tom Dumoulin as much if I look at his performances at the UE Tour and so forth. So my take is that Foz is likely going to end up being the strongest in that squad. I um, I like him for the initial time trial and so forth that will go in later on. He's good at those time trials. He had good time trials, I think, last year at Giro initially and also got good results out of that towards GC. That was his strongest kind of skill and I think that's what I'm looking at when it comes to Yumbo. I don't expect too much from Tom Dumoulin. I'm not going to lie about that. I feel like yeah uh, even top ten will be a hard thing to do even though he uh spent the last few uh weeks I think on training altitude camp. Nonetheless when it comes to other teams like Miguel Angel Lopez and Vincenzo Nibali at Istana, is Nibali washed? A question that arises in my nightmares every single night. I um I, f- I think if he tries, he could genuinely still like top eight to thirteen in this Giro. I don't believe in a podium, oh, which is what a lot of he's people. He's pretty washed. Yeah, he's. Uh, <laughs> but he's washed compared to what he achieved at the rise of his career. But a lot of people would still sign for the results that he could probably do. I would love to see a Nibali that doesn't go for GC, that decides to lose time initially and just go for stages. But that's not going to happen, most likely. Miguel Angel Lopez is a Mando that I do see doing well in this race. Yeah, Lopez is always underrated. He was, he's been sort of on and off this year. It's hard to know with the Astana riders because they haven't been getting paid like uh, <laughs> a lot of the year or paid late. You know, how motivated was he at Torino Adriatico where he didn't do very well? But at Andalusia, he was the strongest rider. He just got sold by Lutschenko at Tour of the Alps. He won a stage. Uh, the gross Glockner stage, not the hardest, but he still won it when it wasn't even that hard a finish ahead of Pino. I think uh, Pino came back because, yeah. So he looks, he's looked fine. He's looked as good as you'd expect. There's no real, as I said, no Stelvio, but there is some still, they do Fedoya, I think, or Fedaya, or they do Pordoy to 2,250 meters. That's high enough altitude to give him something, but there's no beastly high altitude finish like in, the Tour de France this year, where there's some certainly some stages with his name on it. There's no long TTKs, but yeah, he's an outsider. I always like Lopez, and I think he's, I think he's correctly eleven to one is actually pretty short for a guy with his team support and his year so far and his track record in the last eighteen months. That's pretty short ahead of Bardet, who won Tour of the Alps um, and is good in cold and wet, and is probably maybe more motivated. So yeah, that's pretty. I think that's fair. Um, but yeah, any last thoughts on the GC guys, Benny, before we go into our patented stage-by-stage stage predictions and analysis? Yeah, I think we can also note that Boros here with Kaldemon, Buchmann, Hindley, and Kemner. I do think that Kaldemon is going to end up being a stronger rider in that squad 100%. for the GC. 100%. Kemner should probably go for stages based on what he's achieved so far. I think he can achieve a Giro stage relatively doably, knowing how decent he'll he is. Lo- he'll lose six minutes. First, first <laughs> stage, I guarantee he'll lose time. He's here for stages. Yeah, okay. And then Guillaume Martins, perhaps a rider that will generally go for GC points for that team in, in the UCI points ranking thingy. And I think he can 100% top 10 if he tries. Like, should be easy for He'll Guillaume top, Martin. He top 10. Yeah. Hugh Carfi is a rider that will be going for GC, although... I don't know, he's been a bit inconsistent last year compared to the year before, for example. It's it's hard to guess what Hugh Coffey will do, but he's got to come back at some point. Like, he got to come back at some point. But I want to shine a light on Trek for a second. Molemas Ciccone Schielmoz, and Molemas going for that stage win at the Giro because he's got one at the Tour and the Vuelta, and he wants one at each Grand Tour. Ciccone is probably the GC leader, but Schielmoz is the top 10. It's happening. Yeah, he's good, um, and I, I just wonder, as you said, like J.P. Lopez as well, the man, the myth, the legend, 15th at the Vuelta or whatever last year, um, will he be going for GC? Who's the domestique there? Molimer, as you said, will be going for stages. Is Dario Cataldo going to be the one domestique for three guys all, who all think they're leaders? <laughs> so that would be interesting to watch. Giacone, the parkour, I think suits him pretty well as well. But, yeah, that's all the, the main GC men. Uh, every team, most of the teams, except sort of the Italian Pro Conti teams, do have a GC rider that they'll be going for, except uh, like an Azure Desert Citroën uh, and Quickstep and Group Armour and Lotto, a broader sprinter. So it's very polarized. Like it's very clear what each team's motivations are with how they've assembled their rosters here. But 
going into stage one, the Grande Partenza, not the prologue. They have the TT, the second stage. Stage one is I'm not going to call it a puncher's finish, but it's it's a real mix, sort of difficult finish to assess. It's flat stage, so they'll be coming in fresh. First stage, 195Ks, leaving from the center of Budapest and then going north to Visegrad, 5.5Ks, 4.2% this finish, but it's shallower at the base. The last 1,500 meters are about 55 to 6%. We were told by Danny Rev when we interviewed him yesterday, Eurosport Hungary's commentator, that it's freshly... Uh, asphalted, it's good road surface, it'll be fast, but then I'm like, okay, but it's steeper at the end. MVDP is the favorite for the stage. I just, he has to be. Um, he, that's why he's probably here. He saw that for an easy or a good opportunity for Malia Rosa first stage. Pidcock was going to be here, but Paul, he's going to the Tour de France, I think. He was, this would have been a target of him. Germay, second favorite at 450. You in third at 650. He's being given a chance, and then it's like Bala. Kovi, Carapaz, etc. Almeida's 29. I think Almeida wins this stage. Ooh, spicy. I, um, I'm not so sure about it. I think it might go to like someone that has a, a clearer sprint versus the punch area. Because Almeida has a punch, we know that. Polonia and so forth. But Polonia wasn't necessarily at, against the best competition either. Ah, I see Van der Poel definitely as one of the riders that can do better than Almeida here. Positioning is going to be key on that climb as well. But it's long enough that... You might be able to move up by the time we get to the sprint if it really goes badly for a second at the start. I think there's so many riders that can do well here, like a Van Pool, like a Gidemai, like a Magnus Court Nielsen, although he's apparently said that he wasn't going to be in top form at the start of the Giro for some reason. If we have to believe that, no clue. Not Nail Tetzfatsion is like my outsider for like a top five. He uh, is riding for Androni or Did whatever he do that team. on Torino? On, one, on that one Pogaccio one, he kind of attacked a couple of times. There was that draggy finish. Yeah, he did. And he was also in the breakaway with Kemna the other week in uh, whatever that race was. And he's he's got a punch, uh, a punch he's killed to him. Copia Bartali, a good few decent results in the Ricone finish at the start as well, I think, which was also a punchy finish. I think Fad in the group sprint behind Van der Poel and someone else. Uh, someone else did win that race because they attacked that group and so forth. But anyway, pretty good sprint for Sartan. Vendrame, perhaps, but he's been a no, bit disappointing every... Idea. Every he, time you mention it, he kind of disappoints. He he just isn't fast enough. Like he got destroyed in the GP in the rain sprint. Like I think so. My Almeida pick is based on UAE guys may have some flaws, the managers, but they know how to win sort of misc uphill, but not that uphill Giro Italian races. Agrigento 2020 with Ulisi. They led him out. They surprised Sagan, who was the favorite for the stage, and Ulisi won ahead of Honoré and Sagan. And Matthews was there as well. Back when they were the, when Gianetti was the manager of Sonio Duval in 2008, I did a video on this back in the day with Riccardo Rico. There was a very similar finish where Bettini was the favorite and Sonio Duval launched early and Rico won the stage. And so I think... Okay, this could, of course, backfire Benji. We could get a, a clear scenario where Ulisi, Formula, Kovi, Almeida all think they should win the stage. That's probably the likely thing that will happen, <laughs> especially like Kovi looks good, or they play them uh, up the road. Because if, if you do a lead out, just straight line lead out, Van der Poel's going to win, I think. And so you have to you have to mix it up and attack, and that's what I think they'll do, and I think Almeida is quick enough to do it. I do want to say one more thing about this stage before we get to the next one. This finish, ah, it's not super hard, which does put me in a situation where I think that there is a realm of possibility where I do see Caleb Ewan winning this stage. Do you think that the last two kilometers are too hard? I, I think if he wins this stage, the other teams have stuffed up, most, most notably UAE. You can't bring Kovi Formula and those guys to this stage, have a 2K 6% finish. Uh, with some you know uphill beforehand and not put you in under enough pressure that one of your punchy lighter guys wins this stage. So he can, if they go slow, if it's let out steadily, you know, he can, but Poggio's what, 3Ks, 5%, 4%, I keep forgetting, um, maybe even less. And he was fine there in 2021, but I think I, I was surprised to see in that short. I think maybe because he's been getting over hills okay, but Germay's second favorite, 
He's a big chance for him. Juan Gen Vevelhem. That's from a small group. His positioning, if you watched Twitter Polonia last year, it's not it's his weakness. His positioning in groups. There is going to be a big group. Like guys are not going to get dropped at the base of this. It's not that sort of climb. Everyone's fresh, not a hard stage beforehand. Positioning is key for him. And I think they've got Lorenzo Rota here and Barnabas Payak and Amit Hen. So they've got guys that can try and help him, but that's my big, big concern for him. So I like either MVDP, he really should get the job done, or a, a UAE man for that stage, uh, wearing the Malia. And then it's the TT the next day in the centre of Budapest, then goes up to the hill in Pest. It's um, pretty simple, 9Ks, but then, well, no, sorry, the first 8Ks are simple. Then there's an intermediate time check, which is actually with 1,300 metres to go. Then they do a 1,300-metre 4% climb to 5%. Apparently there's Pave in it. Uh, so Pave, a steep like 14% pinch in it. Who do you like for this, Benji? There's no odds, so now we're going to make our own book. That's how we do it, and maybe the book will just the books will copy our odds. But yeah, who do you like for this? Because it's not not the deepest TT field, especially with no Ghana. I think we both agree on this that we've seen Vanderpool do one like big time trial at one time at the Tour de France. Was it last year? Yes, it was last year. Stage four, I think, or five, whatever it was. Incredible TT. A, yeah, incredible TT. You're right, and like. I believe that the shorter time trial like this one should fit him better. And the fact that it's punchy at the end, even more so. I'd say, despite not seeing Van der Poel as the godlike to tier usually, because like he doesn't do it often, so it's hard to see him as like a great time trialist. I do think he is able to win this stage. And I think a lot of people might be surprised at the end of this stage by the ability of Van der Poel on this stage. But there's plenty of other people out there. Like I've said it, Almeida, Foss, um, even a Good form, Magnus Court Nielsen could do well on a stage like this. A Sobrero, Damon Arensman's also pretty good when it comes to parkour well, like, I like this. Sobrero, that's a nice one. Okay, tell me about it. Well, he's just been doing well. He did well in the Giro. He, he, he's come third in the Milan TT last year. We motivated. He's Italian. Bike exchange setups look good. Um, sorry, you were saying uh, Simon Yates off air to me. I want to hear the rationale behind that pick. He got fifth, I think, in the uh, Montluçon, uh, or whatever that stage was called in Paris-Nice. And I believe that it's kind of the same shape, but shorter. So I'm like, shorter might even be better for Simon Yates. And I'd argue that he should be able to be one of the best riders in GC territory, at least, on this time trial. He should take time on most GC riders, except for an Almeida and perhaps a... Uh, Sport. I, I do see Carapaz losing time to a Simon Yates on this prologue time trial, not a prologue. But uh, I don't think the gaps in GC are going to be huge either at the end of this, unless you count the likes of, a, I don't know, a Buchmann still as GC rider. Yeah, and then there's there's no, as I said, no Ghana, but there is Dumoulin, Affini, Foss, like the Yumbo guys you know are going to do well, but it's such a short TT that, yes, okay, Dumoulin might take 15, 20 seconds on Carapaz, maybe more. I mean, give him 30, but I think that's sort of immaterial at the end of the day. Is he good enough to win this stage, Dumoulin? He did a good UAE Tour TT. Affini and Foss both in the top five of the prologue downhill last year, which I think had a little climb and, and then a crazy descent uh, in the Giro last year. But all of that's to say, I think MVP is winning this stage and keeping or going into the Malia Rosa, although Almeida will have to gap him. So it depends depend on the bonus seconds because I said Almeida will take the first stage. I think Almeida will be the one of the best GC contenders on this. I think it suits him really, really well with that punch. And yeah, I think, but I think MVP is winning. He's put up on Instagram. He's got some custom extensions. He's taking it seriously because of the prologue and the Tour de France as well, or taking the TT more seriously than um doing it, writing it for the first time on the morning of the stage for the year last year. So, yeah, suits him perfectly. Crazy talent and there's no Ghana here. Who is your pick for this this stage, Benji? I never asked. For the time trial, I was going to say uh, Van Der Poel as well, but I'll be uh, I'll be a bit of an opposite man. I, I'll go with Damon Arensman as a, a rider Arensman. that I do see well for the time trial. And on the uphill section, his, his prologue this year in one of the races, was it Tireno? Like the short time trial was really good. The hill should help him. I think Arons Mon will podium this time trial. And that brings us to the uh, third stage, which is from Kaposvar to Balaton Fuhed. 
201 kilometers flat and the final is apparently pretty straightforward not that technical so we should see a pretty straightforward sprint throughout the riders that we mentioned earlier as these sprinters in this race is it cavendish territory caleb ewan territory is his lead out good enough if the bias doesn't show up all these questions i know the more technical it is the more important position is then it all goes to even like a Bauhaus. he comes more into play Toronto adriatico last stage Lots of sprinters there. Bauhaus won. Cavendish didn't even contest it because it was an hour running and Bauhaus, yeah, it just, it just makes it more random and the guys who aren't the fastest can't win. So I think that also suits Cavendish with Mercu here. And yeah, I I, I think Ewan's the fastest man in the race. Demar actually has looked a lot better this year than like I think in one of the – he nearly won a Torino stage, didn't he, ahead of Ewan when Ackerman lost his wheel? or He did like a 300-meter sprint. I think he's looking better, but first stage, Giro. I'm trying to remember last year what happened. It was like Ewan didn't win the first one, but then won, won two pretty comfortably. I'm still going with Ewan. It'll be a high-speed sprint to Balaton Fured. There's no real climbs to note. I have to go with Caleb Ewan. I think he's the best sprinter in the race, and Cavs not looked... Uh, oh, he won Torino, didn't he? But I still think, yeah, I think he's maybe not as good as last year. I've got Mark Cavendish for it. I think the Merkel lead out will be uh, invaluable for him. And I think they are more, they are better together than the Lotto situation when it comes to their train. And the positioning will be key despite it not being a technical final. I uh, I trust Quick Step more in bringing Cavendish to the front than bringing him to a competitive position. And therefore, to be able to sprint against the others. But I have one more question when it comes to just all the sprint stages. Is Mathieu Van der Poel going to sprint in these stages, knowing that Merlier fell out of that team with his Roubaix injury and that Chiclamino is up for grabs? Or do you personally expect him to actually leave? Well, that's a good point, right? Because if he doesn't want to leave and he does want Chiclamino, you have to sprint. You have to go for it. And he doesn't like mixing it up in bunch sprints all the time. And sorry, we're not going to do this huge sprint discussion for every sprint stage. We'll get it out of the way here, but... Yeah, he, he has to if he wants to go for Chiclamino. You can't pick it up from intermediates or whatever enough. I think he's obviously fast enough to be winning in top three in sprints here, uh, particularly if positioning is in its technical. He's got really good handling, and they've got no, no more years, so they probably will lean on him to do it a little bit. It's, I don't know. I think he probably will. He likes to linger at the back around 10th wheel in the sprints, and then sprint up like the open side away from people late. He did that in Tour de France stage four. I don't. I never actually figured out why he was doing it. Um, it didn't make sense. The stage uh, that Cav beat Merlier in, um, beat Philipson in when the first stage Cav won. So I think he might do that sort of thing, sprint from 10th to 5th occasionally. Um, but yeah, otherwise Chiclamino will be going to uh, whichever sprinter finishes this race because I don't think it will be Ewan or Cavendish either. So that's the three Hungarian stages. Before stage four, there's a transition day and then they all fly down to Sicily for the same sort of stage that they did in 2020. And it's a very similar arrangement of parkour compared to 2017. They do Mount Etna. I can never figure out what size. There seems to be about six sides to Mount Etna. This stage is 165 Ks and finishes with 25.6 Ks at about 5.5%. In 2017 on this stage, there was zero GC action except for Ilnor Zakarin getting 10 random seconds because the group just didn't chase him. Uh, and Thomas led over the bunch. It was a breakaway won by Jan Polance, uh, who then wore the Malia for a few days. I see that as a – isn't that what happened last year, Benji, with um, – who was it? Dombrowski or like like didn't – I swear in the Vuelta and Giro last year, there was some breakaway wins first week, first few mountain stages. I swear it was Dombro, and then Tarame got him back in the Vuelta. Yeah, I think so as well. I agree in that. I think it was uh... – was it the Shestola stage that that was the mark you right that won the stage? I don't know. At some point, you're right. We saw that this man uh, Tarame did it in the Vuelta as well. Early stage, very similar. Uh, I think uh, I'm leaning towards breakaway as well. It's also dependent on the the win situation on the Etna because I swear in the past it was also uh, always a topic whether it was headwind or tailwind on that climb because it's a pretty open space at certain points. So. Depending on that, that could influence whether attackers have the advantage or not. I haven't checked the weather conditions there yet. It's still a, a solid week out, so uh, I, uh, I did not 
do that yet. Nonetheless, um, yeah, I I agree. I don't know which side this is. I think this is the side. If I my memory is correct, that Contador and Rujano did back in the day, but I also am not sure about it. But uh, it's not a side that says, "Oh, this is going to be godlike action until the top GC wise." I agree that this climb is the one that will be perhaps a bit less uh, selective, and that some of the later climbing stages will be a uh, more working towards actual GC changes. Anything more to add here when it comes to perhaps riders that you see doing well here? Yeah, I got a few. Dombrowski, who I already mentioned, he's on the start list. Leonard Kamner, always going for breaks. Ryan Taramai, again, like it's just history repeating itself. Guys I'd expect in the break. Remy Rochas, David uh, Davide Vieja. Uh, I mean, if Esteban Chavez, there'd never be a better time to lose some time. I don't see him for GC. To hunt a stage, it's easier to win this stage from the break than the later ones as people fall out of GC. And do you think Mollema will have lost enough time, Benji? We've spoken about it ad nauseum recently. Like, this is the one to target from the break when other people haven't been smart enough to lose time because there will be Mollema in the week two and three breaks. It's intriguing because on one end, you'd indeed say... Mollema has spoken a lot about getting that third victory, that third Grand Tour stage win, and making sure that he has that in each Grand Tour. And if he goes for GC initially and decides to change that plan halfway where he then goes into a stage hunting role, then he's not really going for that. Then he's more going for GC first and seeing where he can land. And that's not exactly what I'd see as the thing he should do. I agree that he should be losing time initially. And the only thing I see when it comes to Mollema is the stage wins that he does get. Always feel like it's stages where it's a hill and then a descent and a flat section to the finish line. Like he attacks those kind of breakaways. I don't necessarily instantly remember him winning like breakaway stage with a pure mountain finish on it. So perhaps he might be surprised by a Caicedo or Simon Carr. Like all these riders that we mentioned in those breakaways, that might be a tiny bit better at this point because, like, you know, Mader was it in the Giro as well where he was in the break with Moloma and he beat him, but Mader is a better True, climber than him. most of the riders we mentioned. He did. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. And, yeah, as you said, like, even Lombardia, good effort on Chevilia, but then there's the descent afterwards. Yeah, I see break, uh, depending on the weather. I don't see huge GC action. There hasn't been on Etna except for maybe that Contador stage. In 2017, there wasn't. And I think Almeida, it goes into the pink jersey here and van der Poel loses it uh after stage three or after stage four rather then they go catania to messina where nibali is from but it's not a stage for him it's a sprinter stage with a 20k four percent climb in the first third but 100ks from the top of that climb to the finish i don't really see this posing a problem for the likes of caleb ewan etc so yeah i think this is another sprint stage won by caleb ewan Hmm, I uh, I agree that at this point they should have realized what their sprint train is like already, I dare to say. I think I think I'd say the same. I don't know what the technicality part of the finish is because I for like all these sprint stages I went onto the Giro website and all the stages, the flat stages had the description of the final technical info in English, and then this one stage had it in Italian, and my Italian is not on that level yet. My Duolingo, Duolingo levels are not that high, so uh I'm going to guess that it's a relatively doable finish. So um, ah, I'm going with Ewan as well because uh, we can't give Cavendish everything, can we? No. And I think DeMar, again, it's a lottery. Like maybe Ewan will not just win every stage. Like he has shown the positioning is a big problem. So DeMar will pop up or Bauhaus. It's very tough uh, to really know exactly who will win the sprint stage. And there's another one the next day from Palmi to Scalea Rivera de Chiarfi, 192Ks flat. There's like a 4K, 4% climb at the start where maybe the break will go. But this should be a nailed on sprint stage. And as I said, I'm just going to change up randomly with no rhyme or reason and just pick a name out of the hat. I'm going with Arno DeMar to break the world to a drought. God damn it, stop taking my picks away. I literally had Arnaud Demar written down for this one as well. It's not a technical finish. 3K mark uh, is the last roundabout. Pretty straightforward to the line. Uh, tarmac road, like it's it's nothing special. So on paper, it should be a, a straightforward sprint like you mentioned, Arnaud Demar. I'll go ahead and pick someone else because uh, why not? I'm going to go ahead and say that Gidemai will win a flat sprint stage because he's going to go YOLO on this one. 
I've got some stages for Gernemeyer later. I'm, I am just a little bit concerned about his positioning. Um, but, yeah, he should be – he's the man. I think he should really go for Malia Ciclamino in case uh, MVP is like, actually, I don't want to do three weeks around Italy. <laughs> he's on the later stages. Uh, stage seven from Diamante to Potenza, 200 Ks. I don't expect big GC gaps up to this stage. I think I think Ineos need to full send this stage, Benji. It. It's harder than it looks when you actually look at the profiles. Like there's a 20K, 25K, 4% step climb with some pinches in it. You can really put some calories into people there. Descent. And then Montescuro is 6Ks, 9.7%. That's that's Monte Carpeña hard. And then descent. And then there's some rolling, rolling stage. I see this reminds me of Cormayo Carapaz stage a lot. I think you can get satellite riders in the breakaway. Uh, which Ineos might do, might not do. I think Ineos need to try here and even Bahrain. Put Almeida under pressure far from the line because Edna, if you go slow and, and or steady and then have a sprint, he's going to be toasting Carapaz and, and Lander. So I think Ineos and Bahrain need to try something on this stage. Especially if it's raining, it would really fit on Carapaz's mood to like uh, demotivate Almeida and Almeida's positioning at the start of a climb initially will probably not be that great he's not that amazing at positioning himself on climbs that he doesn't expect action on initially the only thing I'm I'm afraid of is that this could also just become that breakaway stage that is won by Attila Walter for example but the issue there is that Walter will likely not have lost enough time by this point it depends on what his life choices are up to this point but um ah I am um, I hope we see Carapaz do something here. I think he's probably the only GC rider that will try something like that on a Paco like this. Bilbao attacking a descent. I feel like it might be a bit too far from the finish line, even this this last proper climb to make that happen. But I uh, I, I see just a normal breakaway stage, I'm afraid. Yeah, me too. I, I, I'm hoping. I don't mind a break winning if there's GC action behind. I think Jan Tratnik or Felix Goal do well on this stage i really think if tranix is climbing like last year with it's got hard climbs but not a hard finish nine k's five percent is the last major climb then two punchy finishes it's like how he the stage he beat o'connor in um and it all becomes advantage to him over the smaller guys like a goal uh in that finish so i like him for it as ben you already mentioned simon carr kudus might get in the break as well for ef they have to try from the breakaways same with molima this would be a Really good Molima stage too, but I'm going with Tratnik for this one. Ooh, Tratnik for a uh, for stage. Oh, you're you're kind of right in that. You're kind of right in that. But I'm gonna go. Uh, I feel like he might be chained. By the way, like he might be chained to Landa in this Grand Tour. No, well, I mean, true. Was it Landa had crashed out by by Zonkline, right? I don't know about the other year when he beat O'Connor. Was he? Did he have a GC contender behind? That is a concern. Uh, so I have no answer or rebuttal to that. Okay, when it comes to the next one then, we've got Napoli to Napoli, which is uh, stage 8, 153 kilometers. It's an odd one. Like, when I initially saw the stage, I was like, could this be a breakaway stage or could this be like a, a sprint? And I feel like the climbs aren't necessarily hard enough for it to be something a sprint team doesn't give any care about, but it needs to be the kind of sprinter that can get over hills. So like uh, an entomache for Girmay, but my question then is... I've always asked this to myself, and perhaps I'm going to answer it myself right now. This is a parkour where I'd say, what if Gidmaigo just goes into the breakaway? You think the reason that hilly sprinter teams don't do that as a strategy is that they might not be able to control all the attacks that come in the group that is the breakaway later on? Yeah, that's the problem, right? You say, oh, I'll get well out in a break. That sounds great. The Tour de France, we saw what happens when he and MVP got on a break together, working together to control things in stage seven last year. Everyone in the break's like, absolutely not. Are we going to the finish going with you guys? So they attack them. So yeah, that's the problem. I see it the same as you. This is the first gear my stage. I think into Marche need to go all in. The problem is there's a Matthew Van der Poel on the start list. He will not be getting dropped on these climbs, but it's... I mean, if Caleb Ewan doesn't get around this, don't even go to Worlds. Like, this is 1,700 meters, 7%, sort of 1K, 9%, 1,500 meters, 5%. These are not long climbs. The last one's 3Ks, 5% from the finish. Like, if he can, if he wants to do well at Worlds, he needs to get around this. I don't think he will. And uh, I like Germay for this, Benji. I think I think this is the one they'll be writing down if they don't get it done on stage uh, stage one. I think that's a, a good point. I agree on that. I think Vanderpool is my pick then. Because uh, 
I think that he will be there. And I uh, I trust him to have his kick as well at the end of a stage like this. I'm also not really leaning to the breakaway after having looked at the stage multiple times, but a stage that, in my opinion, is definitely not going to the breakaway, stage nine, which goes from Isernia to Blockhouse. This is, for me, the first stage that I see as GC action and... Big gaps. I agree. Solid gaps. And it reminds me, it's not the same climb, let's be honest about it, but the gradients kind of remind me of a... A first, a second week version of Sega Diala, perhaps a big climb before another big climb. Blockhouse being the Sega Diala, then in that question, I think this stage is going to be a uh, major for uh, GC, and we're going to lose at least G- one GC rider that we saw as a candidate for uh, the podium in this race. So this is the climb Quintana won on in 2017. He put 30 seconds into Pino and Dumoulin. Uh, Nibali cracked very badly on it. If you crack on this, it's, yeah, I had to put that in. Sorry, Benji. Benji shaking his head. 14 Ks, 8.5%, and it's preceded by Lanciano, which is hard. This is in the middle of Italy. It's not in the Alps, Dolomites. I like Lopez for this stage, Miguel Angel Lopez. I think with no Pogrog or... Vingegaard or the, or even Mader on the start list, he's a nasty climber. He's got better peak watts than Carapaz was per kill on the steep stuff like this throughout his career when he's on. And I think Lopez, like Quintana did, dances away and wins this stage. Now, whether the GC gaps are, you know, huge, I'm not, I don't think so. Uh, his team would really have needed to pace hard. There is Pronsky, I think, on the start list, my boy. But yeah, I think Lopez wins the stage, no break. And I think, which you mentioned, Benny. You said a GC contender will really get hurt here. I think Dumoulin, if he's still in the mix, is to get and Foss. They lose time here. Almeida is the one I just don't know. Almeida literally can lose a minute on a stage like this and then drop Simon Yates in week three on a harder stage. I nah. I I think this is the kind of stage where Almeida will probably hold on, and I'm more scared for Almeida and like. Let's say any of Spice's up a medium mountain stage, I'm more scared of him there, necessarily. And um, I kind of trust him more on a parkour like this. He kind of has the ability on a longer climb to drop initially, catch back on, drop initially, catch back on. He's kind of got that undying mode on climbs and definitely on the steeper ones where other people, when they drop, they tend to be gone and lose time. He can actually like find himself again and kind of make his way back. So I think on longer climbs, I don't worry as much when it comes to Almeida and on the uh, medium mountain stage. Is that somewhat truthful, you think? Yeah, I think sometimes he gets caught off guard, like the Catalonia stage, first climb of the day, caught off guard in the rain. That wasn't that hard a stage. Groves made it to the finish with the group. Um, I forgot Simon Yates was on the start list. I haven't spoken about him for a while. He's nasty on when he's on. That being said... The Blockhouse video, if you want to see this climb, go and watch the video I did on Quintana's performance last week on the Lantern Rouge YouTube channel. One of the eights, I didn't bother to check which one it was. I think it might have been Adam. I don't know. Got dropped really early on this climb uh, in that edition. I think Simon Yates is the one where randomly, with the group at 15 deep, he could just start dropping on this climb. Like That wouldn't surprise me if that happened. And he could also win it. Because his peak wasp per kilo, as we saw on cold airs, are disgusting, like Miguel Angel Lopez. So I like Yates, but I prefer Miguel Angel Lopez for this stage. And yeah, I think I think Almeida, again, I wouldn't want to bet my house on anything Almeida does on a stage like this. I'm going to throw it to the next stage now. It's a stage that I've been looking forward to, and I hate these stages usually in Grand Tours. This is the kind of betty old stage of last year's Giro. I totally, completely hate those stages because it will be just a breakaway getting away. Sleepy stage. The peloton will give them 10 minutes instantly, and that will be allowed to go because, uh, well, there's going to be two men in that breakaway. We will see the resurrection of the Montalcino stage, Mauro Schmidt versus Alessandro Covi, and I think Covi will take revenge at the end of the, this race, this stage. I think Covi wins in Yesi. I uh, tweeted it about four or five months ago, and I'm standing by that fact. Corby's taking this. I'm looking for a completely misc rider because this reminds me of the Campanats Rizabek stage a lot. <laughs> I'm looking for like a Stefano Oldani. Rizabek's here. Rizabek's here. All right, I'm going to Oscar Rizabek. Um, I haven't mentioned Asia too well too much. Vendrame should be go, trying to get into a break like this as well. They've brought a break team. We, If there was going to be someone winning from the break on – 
in the mountains would be Noel Spetez, but there's the Finnish guy, Jakko Hanenen, who went well in U23s 2018 in that stacked year. Again, he he needs to show something in this Giro. Bardiani have a chance here. Fiorelli is very good. He's quite fast. Filippo Zana is good too. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know, Benji. Magnus Court is my pick, and I know he's going to be the favorite for the stage. I'm pretty sure, like, good luck going in the break with him. Uh, but the next stage, which... Again, pancake flat sprint stage. Bit quiet after the first rest day, proper rest day. 200 days, pancake flat, finishing in Reggio Emilia. It's, uh, is this the wine tasting? They have like a wine tasting stage every year. Uh, but Caleb Ewan's winning this just because it looks so flat, Benji. Hmm, I, um, like, I'm going Cavendish again. I think Merku really put something special in that team. I think he will take his second stage when in this uh, parkour here. And when it comes to like the finish, there's there's some stuff there. Uh, I think the last 350 meters is like straight, which means that on paper it should be long enough for a proper longer sprint to happen as well. It's not necessarily just 170 meters and and Caleb Ewan has the acceleration bonus. So uh, I think I think Cav has this. So um, I'm taking Cavendish for this one. Stage 12, I think, has changed in the last six months, but I, I hope I've got the updated one. It's from Parma to Genoa. It's like a little uphill drag at the end, 204Ks. Again, kind of a nothing stage. If I was MVDP, Benji, I'd get in the break. Maybe it's a smaller break. I Like, Ewan should get around this course. Germay 100% will. It's... Tough to know exactly like Cavendish. Could they drop him on that last climb, 30Ks from the finish? They should definitely try to drop Ewan and Cavendish um, on that climb. It probably won't be hard enough, but I'm going with MVDP for this one. Ooh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch it around. I'm going for Girmay for this one. Then we each have one of these stages for Vanderpool and one for Girmay. Um, I think, I don't know whether it's, like when I see this, it shouts breakaway, but on one end, I'm like, there could be like those two teams that are actually going to control it. We don't have a Matthews with a Bex team that does it this time around, but what if Antimashia and Alpesin decide to work together when it comes to the chase? I know from uh, some inside sources that they uh, were trading off business at the start of Paris Roubaix, for example, who's going to ra- arise there or who's going to ride there. And they were actually like, like, uh, I'm going to remember that you're not, not riding. I'm going to remember it. So uh, I don't know whether they're going to be so happy to work together at this stage, for example. But uh, they could either go in the break or they could do it from the peloton. I think uh, Girmay has chances. And the next stage is an intriguing one, I think. Like, what does the Giro this year have with having a flat stage and then deciding to put a random bloody climb in there with about 100k to go? Because it's too far to actually have an influence on the race. And... I think that's a more pure sprint stage. I think they'll be able to survive the Colli di Nava, which is the climb that I'm talking about, which is like ages from the finish line, and the rest is basically flat. Yeah, it's eleven k six percent, but so far from the finish. Like no team DS is going to tell their team pace that full gas and then pace on the flat for a hundred kilometers. They'll be like, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, I think Powerhouse wins this stage. It's just a misc misc stage, and then. I think all the sprinters go home after that, Benji. That's like the last one until there's one more sprint stage on stage 18, I think. I think we see a mass exodus before the the next stage and everyone goes and I, I don't know who's going to stay. But yeah, I'm going with Bauhaus just because I think it's just a weird stage and Bauhaus wins weird stages. Just got a phone call from Eddie Merckx that he's really angry about what you're saying on this podcast that I should be uh, insulting you at the moment. But I agree that the mass exodus should come. I, uh, I'm going to go with Caleb Ewan here. And it's because I actually haven't zoomed in on the parkour and it looks like it's kind of falls for that pill. So I'm saying it's going to be Caleb, you know, okay? Just believe me at this point. That's it for my take on this stage. So as you can tell, like we've gone Etna, nah, no big GC. Montescuro, stage seven, hopefully some GC action. Blockhouse, definitely. But now we're up to stage 14 and we've had like three stages, two, one and a half of which there probably won't be GC action. And again, this is another Betty old stage. This is from uh, Santana to Torino. It's another stage which I think has changed a little bit. It's got just rolling climbs all stage. And I think it's just like a Tratnik Magnus Court stage. Germay can also win this. Germay is sort of Trofeo de la Guelia, incredible climber. But I just, I just think it's break. Like uh, Intermarche going to be able to control this all day. MVDP, if he's still here, will Alberson be able to control it? So I'm going break, and I'm going, uh, I'm going Leonard Kemner for this one. 
I think what I see when I look at this stage is the same I had when it comes to that week one stage that you spoke about. Cut up, I should blow this up. Like there's potential in this. There's medium mountains, 5K, 6K long, and there's steeper climbs in there as well, where I'm like, this could open up, but I don't believe it will happen in the second week of the Giro, for example. It needs to be in week three where people are like, okay, what do I have to lose at this point? Let's just go and hammer it. And therefore, I also see uh, the breakaway situation happening here. I think Balka Molema wins this one. He completes his triple. But I also want to mention that I don't know which stage it will happen, but I think Magnus Kort Nielsen is a man that will get also his triple. He has a Tour de France and Velta victory before. I think he needs a Giro one as well. I don't know if it's this one. He could genuinely also do it here. He's going to get a stage win somewhere. That's for sure. And that brings me to the next stage, which is one that is intriguing because I have no clue what to expect. And that is Rivarolo Canavese to Konye. And um, it's got like three climbs of which the first one starts with about uh, halfway the stage, roughly. The stage in itself is like 177k long. So let's see about 80 kilometers of potential action although the first climb will not do too much Pilar de Fleur is the uh, first climb it's 12.3k at 6.9 percent the initial 10 kilometers seem to be the steepest between 7 and 8 percent average with a steeper section up to 15 percent somewhere in the middle of the climb uh, I think that climb will not give too much action then we've got Vergonia as the next climb which is 13.8 kilometers at 7.1 percent again the middle part is 8.4 percent for like a good five-ish kilometers at the start there's a steep section up to 14 percent but the problem is the last climb Konya is a climb that is not steep at all the initial like five kilometers not even like the initial kilometers go up to seven percent for a bit average for a, one of the first two kilometers at least 11 percent peak section in there as well but after it goes downhill a bit it starts going uphill it's got a solid climbing section of let's say uh three-ish, four-ish kilometers again, but then it's basically a false flat uphill of three to two percent towards the line for, uh, what is it, a good 13 kilometers. If this race is supposed to be ridden by GC riders, it has to open up early, and does this not fall just before the next stage, or is there a rest day after this one? Because that might have a big influence on how this race is ridden, this stage at least. Usually a rest day after stage 15, so... Yeah, I think Ryers will try something. Again, if you go to the finish in a big GC group, Almeida will take bonus seconds uh, if the breakaway hasn't won the stage. Like he's punchier than the other guys, usually will win. So I think this reminds me of Kumayo a little bit again. Um, when Carapaz beat or took all the time on Roglic and Nibali, where I think I think you try on that. That second last climb, you put put work in on the first one, you drop them on the second last climb, then you maybe have a satellite rider up the road, or you have a companion. Carapaz joins forces with Orlando, who's also got a weak TT and is not a great, you know, beating Almeida in the bonus second sprint finishes. And I think they, I think Bahrain will try for sure. Ineos, not sure. I don't know how technical the descent is. Lander Bilbao, incredible descenders. That's just a that should cover the entirety of this Giro. Just be aware that any technical descent, any long descent, it's a good chance for them to put Almeida under pressure because, as we saw in Catalonia, they are significantly better descenders than Almeida. And then, I don't know because. The false flat bend you can work two ways. We saw in Kumayo when Carapaz took that time, because the draft matters so much, the game theory effect of the second group not wanting to chase while Carapaz just TT'd meant he took so much time because Nibali and Roberts didn't want to work with each other. Um, so I, I like I like Landa and Carapaz for this stage. I think I think they go hard on the second to last climb. Landa's the last person I see doing well on the stage personally. Um like, I've got a feeling with this stage, just like with a lot of the stage in the Giro, that I'm hopeful, but also fearful that it could really disappoint this stage. And uh, I, I don't necessarily see someone that might be willing to risk it all by going early, unless it's like a secondary GC rider like a Bilbao, when they have Landa and GC as well, that kind of stuff. And I think that's possible in that sense. But we're going on to the uh, next mountain stage then, and... Uh, I'll let you do this one, but I do want to mention, are these climbs too far apart before you uh, say the profile? Well, 
No, I mean, I, the thing with the Giro is, as, as Benji said, like the riders, we're really counting on the riders to make this race. Like yeah, it, there might not be anything on that stage 15 stage and then stage 16, what is it? 30 k's of false flat before, after, after each of these climbs and then sort of 5k, 8% climbs before the final stage and it's not a mountaintop finish, there's a descent, but I still think this is a big stage. I still think this is this could kick off and I don't I don't have a big problem with this. Some Italians are telling us, oh, this not as hard as Euro as it could be. I think this is plenty hard enough uh, and I think we should have good action on this. I'm not concerned, Benji. I think the aspect that I'm not necessarily a fan of on this section is that the last two climbs is a smaller climb before a bigger climb. I like it the other way around. I like the bigger climb before we've got a final smaller climb because then you're then you're calling for action on the bigger climb before the smaller climb. Now you're kind of like evading the action on the smaller climb, using it as a bit of a uh, an attrition climb, building attrition into the legs of your competitors. And then on the final climb, the attacks will come. So. I don't expect attacks necessarily before we get to that final climb because, again, it depends on who has something to lose at this point, but there's plenty of hard days to come after this one, including the one after. So I uh, I think action on the final climb is happening here. I think gaps are going to happen for certain. It's not a it's not a Mickey Mouse climb. That last one, that Santa Cristina uh, climb before they descend towards Aprica, goes up to 13% for a section as well. And the second part of that climb, like, Having 10% for half that climb, this is going to make differences and someone will uh, lose time on this day. And I'm looking forward to see who. And uh, yeah, that's my take on this day. I think Simon Yates wins the stage. And I think Benji's probably right that it looks like a Tour de France stage with two medium mount, not medium mount, two medium gradient climbs beforehand where a team will have to be really committed to taking it up if they want to do some damage on 12K, 7%, and then keeping that going for the rest of the stage. So even if someone does be put in difficulty, they'll probably come back. So, yeah, I think Simon Yates wins. I think he gaps people. It's perfect for him. He came. He always has some stages where he goes well in the third week, and I think he wins that one. And then the next stage from is, again, no mountaintop finish. Stage 17 from Ponte di Legno to uh, Lavarone, it starts out of neutral with 9k 6%, so we are obliged to say that is satellite rider territory, getting in the break right there. Maybe, listen, this is what Catalonia was. Maybe I'll send it there and try and catch Almeida napping. Uh, long false light downhill before the two main climbs of the day, 12k 7.6%, and then the Monte Rovere 8k 9.6%. That is extremely difficult, but it crests about... Hmm, 8Ks from the finish, the little roller, but still, the, it, it's like that. Um, what was that Saudi climb, Benji? The sky views of who you're at with the when Maxim van Hills dropped. I'd why am I comparing a 2.1 Saudi to a climb <laughs> with the <laughs> Giro, like hardest third week climb? But anyway, uh, people should be able to keep their gaps again. Simon Yates could win this, Almeida could win this, and I'm going with Joao Almeida taking this stage. I uh, I'm gonna go with Carapaz because uh, I yeah, can't pick Almeida him. because you picked Almeida, so I have to go for Carapaz. I think well, I haven't said Almeida enough. It must be said the guy's finishing is very very fast. We saw on Boitol like I I you know he could win any of the like Etna for example. If it isn't a break like we think it will be. Like that is Almeida Valverde territory, and I think Almeida is much faster than Valverde now. So I think maybe that's even. He is in a group with two guys, three guys over the top of that crest. They work together, gaining time on GC, I don't know, and wins that stage. We haven't mentioned Bardet, Benji. I don't think – ah, uh, there's no real like, long descent finishes. I really think he's like on Blockhouse and those other ones, at the steep gradients, I think he'll struggle. Um, that's just a note I wanted to say, though. Stage 18, Borgo, Valzugana to Treviso, the last sprint stage – it's a lottery knowing which sprinters will be here. I'm going with I'm going with MVDP because I think he's the last man that can do a thousand watts left in the race. Okay, I um I agree that it depends on who's still there. Who will be leaving this race early? Combining all that information, 
I'm going to go with Nizzolo and taking some, uh, well, not that many points, but some points I agree to with that, try yeah. and help out Israel because he's one of those riders where I'm like, he might not actually leave this race. But then again, he did last time when he won the stage. So Yeah, but, we, yeah, but we don't think he will have won a stage up to this point. That's true, which is also a, a visible thought towards potentially leaving the race because uh, if he hasn't won, then he might not do that. That is a... Uh, uh, a good point, a good point, a good point. We've got Marano Lagunare, yes, in the uh, next stage to uh, Santuario del Castelmonte. And this kind of reminds me of that stage that Lafay won early last Giro, which is like a proper climb and then a descent and then a smaller climb to the line. But this is stage 19. Yes, there's a big climbing stage after this. But do you think that people will be like, oh, let's not spend their energy on this one. Let's get the breakaway of victory. Or do you think that it's actually going to be a big guns? It's a tough one. It goes into Slovenia. They do have the Korva climb, 10.3 Ks, 9%. But as Benji said, like it's far from the finish. And then what are you going to do on 6 k 7 k 6%? Like just give Almeida 10 bonus seconds or Valverde. This is the day Valverde should get in the break if he's lost a lot on GC. Uh, he will be nasty on that final climb. Um. Yeah, it's like, are you really going to want to spend your bickies before the last, like, big, big stage, 20 stage the next day, like, spending your team on that climb? I think Benji's right. I think this is kind of break territory because it's just not close enough to the finish. I think Bala from the break. I think I'm going to go for the legend himself, the shadow of the Giro 2020, the invisible man, Jefferson Alexander Cepeda. He was uh, good at, was it Sicily this year? He was good at Alps last year. He ended up being invisible at the Giro last year. This time around, he's going to resurrect himself on this stage because uh, I'm having to name him at one point and I don't think I'm going to do it on the Queen stage that comes after because that's a bit too hard, I think, for that man. And I think the Queen stage will likely go for GC riders. But let's talk about that stage. Well, I was at Camner as well. I think Camner's winning a stage of the Giro. This is the sort of stage he win- wins. And Lucia, similar finish. Demarkey as well could get in this break but yeah i i see break but yeah sorry ben you go on stage stage 20 the last big mountain stage we saw in belluno and is that not like the place where in the arena we had we had that that stage with like multiple hills following each other in a circuit format or am i am i stupid i don't remember italian place names are i always just are they all meld into one for me but yeah, this is the hardest stage. Well, it's one of the only mountaintop finishes apart from Blockhouse, pure mountaintop finish that we have uh, Paso San Pellegrino, 10 Ks, 8%. That's hard. Descent, false flat uphill. Then the Paso Porodoi, which got taken out of the Queen stage to Cortina last year, 12 Ks, 7%, up to 2,250 meters. But then it's again, it's a step descent all the way down before the base of the Passa Fadaya, which was going to be the second of those climbs before the uh, Passo Giao. 13 Ks, 8%, up to 2,050 meters. It's 1-4 Miguel Angel Lopez and Carapaz and all the climbers. Whoever's behind will be trying. Uh, this is the one where you throw it all in like Caruso did with Bilbao last year uh, when he won that stage, 20 stage, ahead of Bernal. And um, it's tough to know who will win, but I'm going with Miguel and Hal Lopez again, Benji. Did I take your pick again? Fuck. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? Like, he was my man for this because I've noticed in the last uh, years that towards the end of Grand Tours, he tends to have sometimes an extra snap. And especially on these queen stages. I'm on a teru. Yeah, and like Plataforma de Gredos, he was in the attack, uh, then ended up crashing i think in a rainy gravel section before they got to the last climb i think this was 2019 vuelta the stage that forgot ended up winning i could be wrong about that but uh also that stage where he ended up slapping a, a spectator in the 2018 giro i think something like that all these kind of situations perhaps he might actually uh get into such a situation again on this one but if he can avoid those situations then i believe in miguel angel lopez on a parkour like this I um I'm not sure he'll still be fighting for a GC victory at this point. I think I'm not sure I see him as a GC winner at this Giro, but I think he's definitely the the man to see for the stage. And when it comes to the stage, like wasn't there like a situation last year at Alpe Moto stage where Almeida was struggling in the descents or something in one of the hardest stages? I mean, yeah, he can always be put under pressure on these big descents from high altitude, which you know, the high speeds, 
yes, mate, like if I'm Bahrain and I'm a bit, I'm behind uh, Almeida, I try him on the descent. Bardet. Bardet as well, especially if it's rainy, he loves the descent. And these aren't, I don't think Bardet likes the nine, ten percent climbs, but the six and a half, seven percent in the draft, you know, he got dropped by Caruso. You have to remember on that stage when Caruso went, they actually, Caruso and Bilbao were following the DSM guys. But yeah, the start of this final for Dyer climb is 5.7 Ks, 10.5%. I think he's going to have trouble following a Yates uh, and a Miguel Angel Lopez if they are really on on that section. They'll put too much into him. But it's hard to know. This will all depend on who's behind on GC. If Carapaz is behind, Ineos will f- go all in to get him to try and win the stage. Bahrain, similarly. UAE, Almeida will try something. It all depends on who's behind. It's impossible to predict exactly three weeks. Uh, this is at the end of the three weeks. But, yeah, what you, what's your last thoughts on this stage? Which is, by the way, Benji, my favorite of the mountain stages in this year. I like the design of this one. I like the design, but I think they could have done it better. And that's what I wanted to comment about, the stage that – the last six kilometers of the Fedaya, the last climb of the stage, are so damn hard. Six kilometers at 10 to 12 percent, sections up to 18 percent. Like, that's so damn hard that people might be scared for those final six kilometers and perhaps expect that they could even open gaps that are larger in those final kilometers and therefore postpone their action until the latter part. So, if there's no action on the earlier climbs, it is because that Fedaya is so hard that people are scared to go earlier. And that's my fear with this stage is that having Fedaya as the final climb instead of the second final climb could make sure that people don't necessarily go early and uh, we'd like to see early action on stage like this 100%. And remember, if it's rainy on Cortina, it was actually EF with for Hugh Carthy who lit up that stage when Bernal then attacked on Paso Gial. So they know this area, they were confident in Carthy last year and he did take some time on other GC guys in the top 10 on that stage stage 21 is the final tt not in milan finishing in verona it has a 4k five and a half percent climb smack bang in the middle of it mauro venue said he didn't want the gc to be decided by tts in this year's Giro, and it really should not be it's 17 k's and there's the 9k prologue dumoulin remember in 2017 moved up from fourth to first on the final 30k tt when he took i mean that was quintana's best ever tt but he still took too much time on him I don't think I know I don't think it should change GC too much here. I think Almeida wins this stage uh, and wins this TT, but I don't think he'll be able to take enough time. Maybe I think it moves him onto the podium of this year though. Ooh, I like that idea. Like looking at the people that started this Grand Tour very quickly while we talk about this time trial, I feel like Almeida, if he doesn't podium. Such a bloody disappointment. If Carapaz doesn't win in this field, should also be a disappointment for Ineos, I'd argue. So, I, I, don't, I, no, I don't know. If, really? If Simon Yates is like on and is unstoppable. But, 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 Simon Yates, the only ground tour that he won was the Vuelta. And in that Vuelta, it was not necessarily, a, yeah, it was not necessarily the, the biggest field. I think it was Miguel Angel Lopez and Valverde, his two competitors in that Vuelta. So, I have not seen a Grand Tour where Simon Yates was beating top-level competitors unless we talk about that 2018 Froome Giro, but that was when Froome was not on until he was on. Well, I know, and that's when Simon Yates, the point of that is he lost 40 minutes on that stage. So, like, how can you, at the history of Simon Yates, not expect him to randomly drop and lose so much time on a stage? And we're sort of we're getting into the, the discussion of how we think GC will play out, but... Yeah, I think I made a wins the TT and and then uh, moves on to the podium. But yeah, I think calling it disappointing for Carapaz, it really depends how it plays out. Like if if Almeida, because I think Almeida can win because there isn't that many mountaintop finishes. I mean, it's always like we saw his watts. Like Carapaz doesn't have better peak watts than Almeida, even on the Steve stuff. He really doesn't. Almeida's got a better TT, better punch. It's the descending. It's the consistency. It's it's all that stuff that is the concern for Carapaz and of uh, concern for Almeida, sorry, and Carapaz got all those soft skills and this isn't the Tour de France. This isn't a mathematical equation. It's the Giro shit goes wrong. It rains. It's unsafe road roads a lot of the time. You don't have teammates all the time or big trains. So that's how the concern for Almeida. But I don't yeah, I don't think I think the Carapaz odds Benji are, are short. 
Like, I like him. He should be favourite, but they're short. Like, he, I know he's got a strong team, but... I disagree. I think he's on Bernal level difference with the competitors when it comes to last year. I got up, I should be able to clean this up. I mean, yeah, and I think... We shouldn't. We we've learnt now. The person that rides for Ineos that has his name as Carapaz in the February races, that's actually his second cousin, Jonathan Carapaz. Like <laughs> that ain't him in the February races at Passage, getting dropped on four Ks five eight percent. A different person, Giro Carapaz. He turns up for the right races. Like it's old school GC rider. I, I like it. Um, and yeah, he should be favourite, but I, I worry that I don't know. Almeida's got a this is why they sign him. This is a big opportunity. If he does have Formolo and, and Covey and Kosh and all riding for him, like he's got a decent team, um, it should really suit him. But like, who do you see as the other? So I should given, I think Ineos basically have the team to light up any of those stages if they want. I think there's enough in this parkour to offer opportunities, even without the mountaintop finishes for Carapaz to take time. And so that's good for him. Landa, similarly at Bahrain, I think um, they have a very strong team with Petrago and, and Novak, Pools, Tratnik, and Bill Bow. So they can do, they can make this parkour work. So I really see this as, um, I see this as three men. I think it's Carapaz, Almeida, Landa, the podium for me. In that order. In that order. Okay, I disagree. Want Landa take? I, I don't trust Landa at all. And perhaps I'm underrating him. I have underrated him before. I have overrated him before in races as well. But this time around, I just don't see it. I don't see the form necessary to to do the, the podium. And I, it's so boring, but I've also got Carapaz in first. And like, if I use my brain and think about what's going to happen in this race, Carapaz first, Almeida second. And third, I'd argue that it's Wood Eater. Like, I want my third rider to be like a hot take, like a Skelmos or like, a Damon Arden's one or something like that. or But I kind of don't see it. Or is Lopez a hot take at this point for a podium? Because I, like, I think it is. I think it is. Because look at his team around him. Like, maybe is David De La Cruz going to ride for him? Uh, that's a good question. He's not getting he's paid Nibali? to ride, so he's is not Nibali? getting paid to ride someone else. Nibali, he, he tends to fold into a domestic role sometimes for a teammate. So I think when it comes down to it, he might actually end up working for another rider but again like these riders all have the issue that they're not sure about their future per se so they might indeed kind of go rogue in certain stages and i don't know what to expect from that so i might not go with miguel Angel lopez based on the rogue aspect for that for that podium a bardet could fit in there stuff like that but um i'm going to go with a sneaky uh podium off i don't think simon yates is going to do it who the hell is going to podium this Pulverde, nah. Guillaume Martin, nah. Garfi, no. Chicone, no. I'm going with Chicone as my podium dark horse. Oh, okay. Chicone is your podium dark horse. I like, or... I like the little descent finishes off the climbs. I think it, it helps now. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. I'm I'm going to... Fuck it. Miguel Angel Lopez, I'll do it anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. I think Lopez has got the talent. There's some steep climbs here and he's looked good this season and yeah, he seems to be motivated. So... Miguel and her Lopez podium, I, I think that's a pretty reasonable pick. Valverde, I don't know. I think Valverde is a better GC rider than Ivan Sosa. It's just whether he's going to be focused on it. Um, but, yeah, I think it's not like there's no big TT. Well, Almeida's the TT threat, but there's only 30 Ks of TT here. I think Almeida's going to have the Malia. The way I see this race shaping up is Almeida has the Malia early. He has a lead early because of the TT, punchy finishes early, and then I think Ineos and Bahrain are going to go at him. And Carapaz and Lander will join forces, and then Yates will do Yates things later. And then who knows? Uh, but that's how I see it happening. And I do think Almeida is good enough that he can drop those guys on a random second week, third week stage like he did against Bernal and co. last year. And if you were, you set it up for him, and he can actually take big time back, not just sprint finishes too. I think the aspect that I like a lot about that here is that if Almeida has the benefit of that initial time trial and moves into a situation where he has that pink jersey, Formula will eventually fall into a domestique well if he's in pink. 100%. I, I oh, don't believe to, that. Has to. Yeah, I don't believe Formula will go dad rogue necessarily in a stage range like this. And like, while Carapaz is my brain pick, 
I would rather see Almeida win this because I'm for young riders in races. We all know that. I'm supporting the young guns and Mate, the Portuguese are you nation. So, are you so in the second on the stage 16 will come out with a steel chair? Me <laughs> throw tax on the road. <laughs> if Almeida's still in pink on stage 20. <laughs> like, whose who's entrance music is that? It's what I so. Oh my God. <laughs> Probably, probably good friends. Probably nothing wrong with the team dynamics. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Speaking of going rogue, I'll let you finish, Benji. <laughs> Completely forgot what I was saying. But uh, when it comes to there, I'm, I'll switch it. I'll go for Almeida winning the Giro because why not? I need to support something different than you. I can't agree with you. Like, it's not in my blood. And that's why I'm, I'm going to go for that. But uh, let's jump onto the Chiclamino discussion, perhaps, because... Uh, Who's finishing this? Yeah, that's the question. I'm going, I'm going Binyam Garamai. I will take Chiclamino. Because uh, I, I don't trust. There's a 25% chance MVP leaves. There's a 25% chance MVP doesn't contest a bunch of sprints or knows how the intermediate sprint points work. Because um, not all of them give, only one of them gives time. And the Giro is a bit weird. I, First one, I think. Yeah. So, oh, gives points. Yeah, I'm going Germay, <laughs> Chiclamino. But I also want to add that I don't think the intermediate sprint points at the Giro matter that much in nah. the grand scheme of things. And as a consequence, they're not giving those 20 points. Thus, they don't lead to the actual deciding factor of that. So it's going to be based on stage, I'd say. And um, I don't think it's possible for a GC rider to take it. I don't actually know. If everybody leaves, then it might be possible. I don't Almeida know. Almeida could take it if everyone leaves. Almeida is still for wide jersey. Almeida takes the leader's jersey, the points jersey, the wide jersey, and the mountain jersey. Is he jersey. still young enough for wide jersey? I have no clue, but I'm saying he will. Okay. Um, why jersey at the Giro is, I remember, who fought? Did Lopez and someone fight for that years ago in 2017? But yeah, or 19, I can't remember. But okay, I made a white jersey. I agree with you there if he's eligible, which we hope he is. Um, I think he is because the white jersey was like up to 27 years old in these races. Um, and so are you going for him, Chiclamino? Every jersey. Okay, KOM, unfortunately, there's no uh, Jeffrey Bouchard on the start list, who's just the easiest pick ever. So I'm going to go for an Azure to our teammate. They don't have much else except for sort of stage hunting to go for. So I'm going Nance Patez will take the KOM. Benji just did a, he just did a, ooh, mini ooh. likes that pick. Yeah, I, I like him because he's kind of that rider where you would say he would fight for the stage win as well somewhere. So he's definitely going to be in breakaways. And um, I'd like to see Walter win KOM, definitely in a Grand Tour that starts in Hungary. But I fear that he's going to end up too much in a GC battle initially. And then towards the second part, he's going to be like, okay, perhaps I should have gone for stage wins. And then he's going to be too late for those stage wins. And then we might not get too much out of that. But um, I'd like to see Aeolo Cometa take away a, a mountain jersey. And Marton Lina is not at this race, if I recall correctly, which is their dude that tends to sometimes pick up mountain jersey somewhere it's kind of a shame that a hungarian is not present in the hungary giro it's but his results haven't been amazing recently i think as a consequence i'm going for fortunato ah <laughs> i've got not the confidence that i had at the start of the year when it comes to his top 10 here so i think i'm going to have to go for kwm jersey fortunato which already would be amazing for contador squad there hey, he's going for 15th on gc i think I don't reckon he'll be he'll go for it. Uh, I hope, yeah, I hope one of the Pro Conti Italian teams, whether it's Ponama goes for it, Fiorelli or Zanna, Zanna can probably go for it uh, as well. Will or Ponomar Diego Rosa could go for it. He's an old climber. Will Ponama have to ask his parents first? <laughs> yeah, or? see, is there a special white jersey? It's like extra white, but like teenage, <laughs> teenagers <laughs> still in the race. He should be eligible for that. Um, otherwise, there's Pedrero could go for it, or Sinitiero, Lazcano. Uh, Matthew Holmes has gone for these sort of things before. Lotto usually like to have a rider also go, or Monica. Caleb Ewan. <laughs> yeah, Caleb Ewan. Yeah, Poggio Ewan. Monica, I think, is a good chance for it uh, as well. But that was our Giro d'Italia preview. As a reminder, if you want to watch the race live, you can go to GCN Plus, use gcn.eu slash LRCP to get 25% off. If you're in the UK, USA, Canada, Australia, or Germany, that's where we'll be watching the race on this oversized TV in our Airbnb behind me during the Giro d'Italia, as well as 
go to Zwift.com for a free seven-day trial to check out the online cycling platform that's made the training for me and Benji. It's changed. Both of us just it's increased my confidence a lot um, because people, unfortunately, especially when you wear a bucket hat and sunglasses, as disgusting as I wear, they recognize me at races now. So it's helping me get back into better shape and appreciative of Zwift for that and for them supporting us coming to the Giro in the Grande Partenza in Budapest. But let us know down below. Most importantly, who's your pick for the winners? Who are we underrating? I don't need to tell people to tell us who we're underrating. Usually people will be like, you forgot him. You forgot him. It's like there's, a, there's 200 people on the start list. It's an hour and a half review. We can't mention everybody. It's already too long. Um, but yeah, let us know who we're missing. If, we're, if there's some local knowledge of that Slovenian climb, people are like, it's actually Pave. It's 11%. We love hearing info like that. It helps us during the race. Thanks for all your support. Most importantly, I don't. We don't thank you enough for your support for getting the podcast LRCP to where it is now. Both Benji and I are very appreciative of that. Loved all the feedback and the love and the comments on Twitter yesterday. And yeah, we'll see you. I think we've got an interview coming up with Eurosport Hungary Danny Rev Thursday or Friday, dropping before the first stage, and then we'll have our traditional three stage recaps and then a Q and A dropping on the transition day. Not a rest day recap because. It's only been three stages. There'll be normal two-day rest, re- the two rest day recaps later. Thanks as always. Bye from me and Benji. We'll see you shortly. Ciao.